Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, Max with Buzz Talks here. Uh, we just watched Game of Thrones season seven, episode six again, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm excited to talk this episode hey today with how's me. Going? Oh uh, Max shit! Buzz Talks here. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> that's my video in the background. I'm welcomed by Mark from Enchantment of Eternity. Uh, the reason why I really do live streaming is because of him. He got me onto it. So uh, what's going on, Mark? Yeah, uh, it's so great to be here on, on Buzz Talks, uh, talking about Game of Thrones with you on your channel for once. So this is great. As yeah, great. I uh, just love getting a chance to talk about Game of Thrones with you. And yeah, I want to get into this episode, which I don't. I'm still soul searching about this episode, but I'm coming closer to a conclusion on it. So yeah, <laughs> so you know what? See. I'm honestly in a similar boat. Initially, I was like really upset, and I'm glad I got to watch it again today because I was able to, you know, really look at it and because I know what's coming, you're able to reevaluate it and say how you feel about it. And like, um, I still have certain gripes about it, but I've come to terms with what it is. And it's so funny because I went and I was talking to other people about some of my gripes and some people don't even like, they don't feel negative negatively about the episode that the way that I do. Um, so before we get into it, Mark, what were like, you'd say the positive aspects of this episode? What did you really enjoy? Well, I'll say, and I probably get, will be met with a lot of disagreement, but I totally enjoyed the Winterfell storyline. Like, I didn't have any issues with the Winterfell storyline, personally. I love the interactions between Arya and Sansa. I thought they were true to their characters and the kind of people they are now. Uh, and I actually liked the little scheming, little finger scheming part of it. Uh, and... Uh, so and the the other part with the White Walkers attacking it was very very intense. I love the character interactions we had beforehand. It was nicely setting up this fellowship that was so hastily rushly put together in the previous episode. It actually took time to like see these characters interact, see Tormund talk to uh, the Hound and stuff like that, which was cool. And the fight scenes themselves was were really intense, and I was sort of on the edge of my seat uh, the whole time. So. So I, I did think those were, were positives of it. Yeah, I agree. North of the Wall for me, I really, really enjoyed it. I do obviously have some circles about it, but the action was amazing. Um, some of the character moments I thought was awesome. Um, in, in Winterfell, I really enjoyed the first scene between Arya and uh, Sansa, how she's talking about Ned Stark, kind of standing there clapping as she was shooting arrows. Um, there was a lot, a lot that I loved about this episode, but I find that where my initial problem came, was I love the episode up until they captured the white. I don't I don't know, just like with Gendry, them sending him back and he starts running the marathon and then we see him running in the dark. Just certain things I would have tweaked. Um, but other than that, I did really enjoy it. And I've come to terms with certain things. Um, but that being said, do you have any, like, what was a big gripe that you had? Was there anything that you really hated about this episode? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the thing I hated the most, and I've been saying this ever since I read it in the plot league, was the dragon coming back. That's uh, so funny. Into wife. It's funny how so different I, everybody is about it. Because I loved it. <laughs> yeah, so I know some people loved it, but to me, like I don't know. I'm more of just the way it was so telegraphed, and plus, I, just the fact that they managed to kill the dragon so easily. If it, it makes yeah. the Night King seem like a Mary Sue character to me, like he's in, an unstoppable, he's invincible. And how the fuck did he know the dragon was? I don't, I don't know. It's just yeah. that's the part that really bothered me, and the fact that of Daenerys showing up at the last second to save them. Yeah. I'm like, this is a. And then they do it a second time in a row with Benjamin See, coming yeah. on to the last second to say, John, like doing the two telegraphs thing. And when the whole, when Daenerys came, I was like timing it. I was like, the first time I watched this episode, I was like, okay, Daenerys is going to come with the dragons in five, four, three, yeah. two. And as soon as I said one, they showed up. I'm like, it was so telegraphed and so predictable. Yeah. It was telegraphed like Battle of the Bastards. <laughs> like you're like, the veil's coming now. <laughs> with Battle of the Bastards, like you totally knew. Yeah. But I think yeah. with the dragon, I wanted to talk to you about that. Like, I, I, I think I'm on my own here, and I, and I don't. I'm really confused. Um, the dragon that died to me seemed like it had green eyes. Like, I don't know if I'm colorblind, but it seemed like he, he had green eyes. And we've seen the dragons; their eyes are the color of their scales. Regal had have green eyes. Drogon has red eyes. Did that seem like Viserion to you? Because I swear to God, it was Regal. Well, I gotta be honest. I never really differentiated differentiated between the dragons before. I actually just learned their names like recently. Like I knew their names for a long time, <laughs> but 
I didn't actually remember them. Uh, so I can't, I can't tell which dragons wish to be perfectly honest. So I'm still open. I don't know who it was. I'm still open to, if you say, I don't know if everyone's saying it's Viserion and the plot leaks say it's Viserion, then I'm probably more likely to stick with that yeah. until I'm not going to say that's definitely the case. So if they reveal all oh, this was Regal, I wouldn't be surprised. So uh, I don't know. I just don't know. I'll just go with the flow. <laughs> I, I was just unhappy with the fact that it wasn't made very clear. Uh, I, I think we can assume this, but it wasn't made very clear that two dragons survived. Because after that scene yeah. where you saw the dragon died, I was purposely, very purposely looking out to see the other dragon. But I didn't, other than like after you know the Viserion, whoever was, died and fell in the, uh, in the ice. We've only seen Drogon. I think that was a mistake. They should have made it clear, especially when they're back at Eastwatch and flying around, they should have made it clear that there were two dragons surviving. But I'm pretty sure that's the case. I was actually doubting, oh, did the Night King kill them both? But I don't think that's what they're saying. But I just think they should have made that more clear. Yeah, it was interesting because Rhaegal kind of, or Rhaegal or whichever one died, or sorry, the one that died and then the one that lived, he he like he did disappear. Like Drogon kind of saved them and then they hopped on him and they took off. And then you're right, we didn't we didn't see him at all. Um, just regards to like the javelin and stuff, I was thinking about it and as I was watching this episode, I'm like, yeah, how did he know the dragons were going to come? Like he came prepared with that javelin. And to me, it was like my biggest gripe with this episode, and it sounds stupid, but it was the ice. The fact that the ice broke, I thought like pause the whole episode and it, it ruined my suspension of disbelief. Like I'm in Canada. Okay. I see cold winters in Canada and in one month you can free, it freezes completely through. You can drive cars on it. And the fact that John stepping on the ice cracked, it really threw me out. And then when the night King came, it froze completely over. And they, they've realized that from a rock. I was just thinking about, you know, what if we learn more about the night King and he could maybe potentially green sea and like his whole plan was actually to wait for the dragons to come. Mm. Like he knew that they would come. And that's why he was baiting them. That's why he would surround them. It wasn't the water that was doing it. It was the Night King surrounding them to use them as bait to bring Daenerys. I just feel like it was misplaced to rely on them being safe with the water. I wish they found another way to write that. But I may be on my own. I, I'm not from an icy place. I never lived in <laughs> The ice didn't well, bother you at all. Not. No, well, I, well, I guess well, I grew up in the East Coast where we had a couple of snowstorms and stuff, and but it was never that bad. So whenever a uh, lake or something iced over, we knew not to walk on it because it was very thin and you would just fall through. So I think it's plausible yeah. that it was thin at first, and then the Night King came and made it made it more thicker. So uh, that part didn't bother me. But what did bother me was the fact that once the Whites figured out that the um, ice there's a, there should be like the white starts surrounding them on all sides which doesn't make sense to me because we saw like the a whole shitload of white crash into the water and so they created yeah. a hole so i don't know i guess they're saying the night king smoothed that hole over but that i don't buy i don't buy that i think the hole should have been there so they should have only been able to come at them from that one side that was my only gripe about it yeah i just seem like they portrayed it like a lot of the whites were like they have a certain level of idea or code on like what to do like the night king it seemed like the night king didn't command them to go attack it seemed like the one white was like oh shit, the ice didn't break and then he like went to go <laughs> attack them so I just I just found that interesting and like I, I want to see the Night King more and him in command more and uh, I don't know I just with the, with the hound smoking that white in the face I thought it was hilarious but I wish they found another way to explain them coming forward. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. And I I want to talk what you said about the Night King green scene because I did think of that as a possibility as to how he was prepared for the dragon, but I'm not sure. Like, uh, if they explain that in the future, then in retrospect, I'll think it's okay. But for the moment, I still do. I just don't buy yeah. how prepared he was for it. And even if he can green scene, I, I wonder, like, what's the implications of that? Will he know all of their next moves and everything? And I don't know. I just, I just have issues with how impossible he is to, to yeah. beat at the moment. It's just one of those things you'd have to – you'd have to explain it, explain it beforehand. And like we've seen interaction between Bran and the Night King and like maybe that could be the jump start to that, but who knows? I'm really curious as to how they're going to, to play it off. Um, but before we get to uh, 
we break down all the action set pieces further. I actually really want to talk about uh, one of your favorite parts, Winterfell. Um, so a lot happened, and I was just wondering. So we see a lot between Sansa and Arya, and I was really curious as to what you think Littlefinger's plan is, because we've seen a lot happen. We know that um, Sansa and Arya were obviously at ends. He kind of snuck in that letter, and he's trying to put them at odds. But one thing that I was really like curious about was we see Littlefinger bring up Brienne, and he's kind of pretending mm -hmm. like he doesn't know what's going on. He's like, oh, you can use Brienne to kind of help you guys calm things down. But it's like he's saying one thing, but I feel like he means another, because I found it interesting how Sansa sent Brienne away later that episode, almost wanting, like not wanting her to intervene between her and Arya. Yeah, well, my, my take on that was... Littlefinger by bring, bringing up Brienne, what he was saying was, oh, you can use Brienne to help out with the Arya situation. But what he was really doing was letting, reminding Sansa and letting her know, hey, Brienne is just as obligated to follow Arya as she is you. Therefore, she's a threat to you. Get rid of her. So I think that's what Sansa got out of it. Sansa got out of that conversation. Oh, I need to send Brian away because she's just she's just as obligated to follow Arya as she is me. So then she could become a problem, and so she complicates things. So that's why she sent Brian away. And I think that was actually very clever of Littlefinger. That's why I think he still has it. I don't think he's lost it. I think he's just as clever and scheming as he always has been. And I thought that was a very clever move because he rightfully recognizes that Brienne and Arya were the big threats to him. And he's effectively gotten a way to turn them both against Sansa or send them both mm -hmm. away or turn them against each other. So I think Littlefinger is doing a pretty damn good job at the moment. <laughs> well, for sure. Yeah, you see like the anger going on between uh Arya and Sansa and like to be honest it kind of caught me off guard like the first scene to me definitely made a lot of sense and I think they played it very well like based on the leaks it said that you know they would use this letter and I think they really did a good job explaining like Arya was pissed because um obviously she ratted them out she betrayed their family and I like I like how they brought Lady Marmon into it because it's oh, like yeah. <laughs> yeah because you know we did hate Sansa because she was at an age to know better when mm -hmm. we were watching earlier and I, I think it made sense that they, they played that off well, the thing with me, and I was I was just writing this for my review, which I haven't put out yet, but I actually, in that scene where Sansa and Arya are sort of fighting and at the start and Arya is saying, oh, you should have done this, I am 100% on Sansa's side. I think Arya is being unreasonable. Yeah. I mean, to compare her to herself or Lyanna, she's not, she's not yeah. them. She's Sansa. She was very yeah. fragile at the time doing what she thought was best uh, to save her father. So I think Arya is being completely unreasonable, but I think it's actually good writing because I think that is totally how Arya would react. That's totally within their character, and that's why I love this scene because it showcased the, uh, their differences. Yeah, it does for sure because they, like, they've grown up so different they couldn't really possibly understand where each other came from. And that was touched on too. And uh, yeah, she pointed out to Arya like she should be so thankful because she won over Winterfell and, uh, yeah. and all those things. Um, but then it goes to really the last scene after Sansa sends away Brienne to run this mission for her. And um, first of all, with this scene, this is where Sansa, Sansa goes in and checks out her faces. I wanted to know what you thought about this scene. Because first of all, it caught me off guard because um, I felt like he was kind of thrown in there. Like, I don't know if it fit. Did you think it fit there? Because like we, we spent so much time with John and Danny, and I feel like they're just kind of like, oh, shit, we need to put this in here. And then they went back up north. I thought it was fine because it was after, if I remember correctly, it was after all the big battle stuff. So they had took a little breath to show the Winterfell and then got back to the aftermath of the war, if I remember correctly. So I wasn't, I didn't mind the placing of it in the episode. I thought it was fine. And I thought, and this was a really, really tension filled scene as well. Yeah. Uh, and my, it was Sansa was looking for the, little note scribe which i think was a pretty dumb move on her part <laughs> but she found the faces instead and then do you think Arya's anger came out because she was kind of spying on her in that way like it was almost like a power move because initially when i watched it i was like holy shit why is she so angry but i think i guess i've kind of come to the terms that obviously the betrayal thing the discussion they had earlier but sans is going through all of her yeah. stuff and it's kind of letting her know yeah. that i'm powerful too like don't mess with me 
Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. I think she was just angry from the whole scribe and from the whole conversation had earlier. I think Arya knew Sansa would search her room, so that's why she purposely left the faces there for her to find. So to let her know how fucking scary she is and how scared of her uh, she should be. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, the more I watched it, it just made me think, like, I don't think Arya wants to harm Sansa at all. It, it's more of a... It's more of a defense, you know what I mean? Like she's she's a certain way internally, but she kind of wants to like make Sansa kind of nervous. But what what I was wondering, like I don't know how to interpret Arya giving her cat's paw, um, because she gave it to her and left. She made a threat and then left. So I just wonder if that's significant in any way. Yeah, I I, I was a bit puzzled by that too, actually, when I first saw that scene. I'm still not entirely sure what her point is. I think, I think the main point is just to say, you know, I'm not ready to kill you yet, but you should be fucking terrified of mm -hmm. me. Yeah. That's that's what I think the whole point of giving her the dagger was. Like, you, this dagger won't save you because I could, you know, I could wear anyone's face and kill you at any time. Uh, that's kind of what I got. I mean, I was wondering if maybe she was like trying to sort of said I'm on your side or whatever, but I don't. I'm not sure that was the case. Yeah, that popped in my head too because like I started going crazy tinfoil, and it's like, what yeah. if Arya <laughs> wants wants to do this and this, and all this shit is happening, but really it's to go against Littlefinger. But uh, I feel like they really paid attention on the knife. Like they were showing the knife the whole time, and then they showed her pass off the knife. Like it was significant in some way. And it was like handing off, saying that they were on the same side. But I just, I could just picture the scene after where Arya's like, "Hey, can I, can I get my knife back?" Like, it's like <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was just wondering. Like, I, I wonder what the significance is. And and um, we uh, like going forward. Uh, for those of you who don't want to know about the plot leaks, mute it, and then you'll see me wave my hands again when you can come back on. But like talking plot leak, like, how do you think this whole thing's gonna re resolve? Because we know both sisters are totally at ends. And we have an hour and 20 minute episode to resolve this. So I, I'm just, I don't know. Yeah, well, getting getting into plot leaks, I think it's, to me, the only thing I can see happening is for some reason, they actually find out that Littlefinger is behind this whole thing that he's scheming. And that reason very easily could be Bran if he opened his big mouth instead of just sitting there talking about stupid shit. <laughs> Come on, Bran. But uh, I do think that they're going to find out that Littlefinger is the one who's behind pushing them apart and behind all this shit, and they're going to scheme to uh, overtake Littlefinger. And I think Sansa now has an advantage over Littlefinger because she knows about Arya's faces, and that's something he doesn't know. And I think they're going to use that to their advantage, and that's why they introduced the faces thing, is that the two sisters are going to use that against Littlefinger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would love, I would really love to see that. I'm like, I'm curious as to how they're going to handle it. Like, her giving the knife to me raised a lot of questions. And, like, so a part of me wants, like, a twist, but I don't think it's going to happen where it's like, we were on the same side the whole time, what? But they're, yeah, they I, haven't... I I don't, I don't think that will happen. Like yeah. uh, last week's discussion, me, you, and Atkin, Atkin brought up that uh, possibility. And I think it was a good uh, theory at the time, but with this episode, I think it's pretty much ruled that theory out. And if they did do that, I'd be very unhappy because it would be very inconsistent with what we saw in this episode. But I do think something's going to happen to bring them together. Like they're going to figure out Littlefinger's the one scheming. Yeah, and uh, another thing, so like we have been set up, um, even Tom F. said in the chat that Brienne seemed to be, you know, onto Littlefinger, and Sansa has been onto Littlefinger this whole uh, show as well. So I find that interesting how she, she's been onto Littlefinger the whole time, but we get a scene with her kind of, it seemed like she was asking him for advice. Yeah, she's not really on to Littlefinger. She's just weary of him. She keeps him at arm's length. And in fact, she's beginning to trust him more because of Arya, this Arya thing, which is exactly his plan. That's why I'm saying why his plan is working so goddamn well. So she's starting to trust him more and let her guard down, which is the... So I, I do think that, uh, yeah, she never... She never knew, she was never really on to Littlefinger, I would say. She was just weary of him, and she's becoming less weary of him, which is a bad thing. So I think something's going to happen where she's going to completely be on to him and figure out that he, exactly what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Um, and uh, I actually, I kind of want to move on to uh, Dragonstone. Uh, really interesting scene um, with the, the scene between Daenerys and Tyrion. 
Um, a couple of, a couple pointers that I wanted to ask you about. So they pointed out, they talked about Cersei and schemes and they were worried about maybe her pulling something on them, which is granted. Cause that's what I was waiting for in the last episode. I was like, well, come on, Tyrion, you know, your sister, she's obviously going to try and betray you. And, uh, he pointed out that they're not going to lay any traps, but they need to be aware of it. And, um, just him saying that if she dies, they're going to burn King's Landing to the tombstones. Did that to you line up with like Tyrion's character? Sorry, I just got a little bit distracted by the chat. Can you just repeat that last part of it? Oh yeah, no problem. Um, no, I was just yeah. wondering with um, so the scene between Daenerys and Tyrion. Firstly, um, I was curious because um, what's it called? Tyrion says that if they kill her. Like they're gonna go with two armies and they're gonna burn King's Landing to the tombstones. Do you yeah. think that that lined up with his character? Because like this whole time he has been saying. Yeah, I, that was a, that was a fail safe though. I think that lines up with this character because that's a fail safe. And I think that what he was saying is not that they were actually gonna do it; is that they will have that threat there to keep her in line. So I don't think he intends to use the dragon stuff to burn her line. I think he intends to just have that threat there, and he's assuming it's going to keep her in line so they won't have to use it. It's like a, a, a nuke, having a nuclear weapon. It's like a fallback that you never want to use. Yeah, and have, have you seen the preview for the next episode? I have not, actually. What? <laughs> yeah. I should have watched that, yeah. Okay, so you get you get a little sneak peek of the Unsullied and of the, and the Dothraki kind of pulling up to King's Landing. It's a great shot. But, uh, yeah, there was a shot with, with uh, Grey Worm there. I thought that was the shot in Highgarden, but it turns out he's actually in King's Landing. So she's going full prepared, and I just wonder how much time we're going to be spending there, but we're going to get all of those characters together. Um, but what I find most, like that scene that we were talking about, it mentions democracy. Like, what did you what did you hint with Daenerys talking about um, how she wants to break the wheel? Tyrion's worried about how it's going to stay broken. She can't have kids, and they're trying to find a new way to get an heir. He said the Night's Watch have one way. The iron, the the uh, oh yeah, from Pike, they have another way. It hinted at a yeah, whole different hierarchy, and he was saying like you can't do what you want to do in a, in a single lifetime maybe it's a the world you want to build is so far out of reach and it'll take a lot of work that is a very good point i actually didn't pick up on that exactly and that goes along with the theory a lot of people had that the show will ultimately end with westeros becoming a democracy of sorts or a republic of sorts rather than a monarchy uh, which i'm not still totally sold on but that is interesting that Tyrion brings up this possible other possibility but then again we have to remember that in the previous episode it was foreshadowed that john is the rightful heir of the kingdom so that might be setting out for him becoming king which i'm less happy with uh did you oh did you are we beyond talking spoilers or whatever did you ever wave your uh, hands again for fuck that? it oh yeah whatever just we're, we're done we're off the rails sorry yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're done with the spoilers but yeah yeah those are my thoughts. No, that. talk about spoilers. Screw it. We're just going to mention everything. Whatever. And there isn't, oh, there isn't that much. We're just going to talk about spoilers? We'll just, we'll just talk about it. Whatever. If you want to talk about right, it, sure. talk about right. it. <laughs> Not a big All right. Deal. Sure. Um, ba -ba -ba. What was I going to talk about? It's hard leading a chat. It's like, it's so weird. I got the <laughs> chat. I got you. I got all this stuff. It's a lot of work, Mark. I don't know how you do this. Oh. Yeah, it's multitasking. Anyways, but yeah, no, I was just I was just saying about the democracy thing about I'm not sure how that's that's what they're leading to, but it was interesting because I didn't see that scene as being about that, but it is. I, that is a good point. I didn't catch the first time. Well, I just I couldn't believe they had the scene in there because for me, like they, she said that she was going to break the wheel. I think that was in season five. Everyone had those theories, and like you, I was like, ah, I don't know, I don't think that's going to go anywhere. <laughs> but this scene really fleshed yeah. it out, and I don't I don't think it's a bad. It wouldn't be a bad move. Like why. Why not reinstill that um I, I don't know how you feel but i don't think daenerys is making it out of here out of this alive um i think daenerys is making it to the end of the show but not past the end i think yeah. she dies in like the last episode yeah but i think this um a difference in selecting leaders i think almost would have to happen because maybe there's nobody who has a right to the throne left and uh you would have to vote them in and you'd have to choose mm. your best leader, and in that way, it could it could change the way the whole the whole world works. I mean, so that's interesting. If you think about it, Westeros has always 
already become a bit loose on this because Cersei had absolutely positively no claim to the throne whatsoever. Yeah. She just took it and they just gave it to her. Uh, and I suppose you could say the same thing about Robert Baratheon, although that one's a bit more debatable. Uh, yeah. But with Cersei, she absolutely had no claim whatsoever. Uh, so it's already sort of freeing up Westeros to try a different system. Yeah. And Ilaria Sand, too. Like, you're finding that as the show's going on, people are putting their yeah. faith. Well, she's fucked now, but they're putting their faith yeah. in, uh, in women <laughs> leaders. And, that, and that's what Arya said in this episode, too. Oh, what, mm. I actually, like, I really love the scene where she's like, um, I was looking at my dad clapping, and, like, I knew that, like, the, the rules were wrong. That was the overall, like, arc of the, of the scene. Oh, yeah. And that I was think, cool. You know, it hints a lot that, hey, like, why can't you vote for your leader? You can be a woman or man, whatever. And the show's kind of hinted that way. And she kind of hinted that way. So, uh, yeah, I think that'd be a really interesting uh, Well, that's why I say there's like a, a duality. It seems like in one way they're leaning to away from the whole minarch and line of secession. But in the other way with the whole, you know, Prince Ragger and John being leg <laughs> legitimate, it seems like they're justifying the whole monarchy and line of secession heading back in that way. So these two themes seem conflicting. So I honestly don't know which direction they'll go in. I'm very confused too. And what's funny with John is like, like fuck, I'm, the, I'm a John fanboy. Everyone knows it. <laughs> but what's funny with him is that he's 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 been. Um, he has no right, and he is one of the characters that was selected for first of all the Night's Watch by voting. And mm -hmm. secondly, by King of the North over his sister, over everyone else. So um, he's been both elected and then it seems like they're going to back his name up too. And I'm like, I'm curious how they're going to play that off. Like if, when he's John Targaryen, I'm sure he's still going to go by Jon Snow. So I just, yeah. I just, I wonder how that's going to play in the story. And I'm sure we're going to get an Although answer. Although if the plot episode. leaks, the plot leaks are going to be believed he's going to be Aegon the Sixth Targaryen <laughs> yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Named after his brother. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> but the plot we'll links haven't been wrong yet. They haven't been wrong yet, so I think that's that's definitely where it's going. I know. I just hope he doesn't <laughs> go on about uh, about his family name and like that. That was something. So if we go over to uh, North of the Wall now, we got a lot of character scenes with Jorah and John, and he tried to give him his sword back. And uh, I don't know how you felt about the scene, but me personally, like I feel like it was a scene that we all knew was going to happen. Like it was just like a natural thing. Like he had his father's sword. It seemed like he should address it, but um, yeah, I, I don't know, like. I will say I've seen. I saw some people even complaining last episode. Be like, why didn't John give George his sword? And it's just like, well, hold up, just hold your horses. It's coming in the next episode. Yeah, and if it never happened, I would have been fine with it. Like yeah. it was fine. But the one thing about the scene that I found interesting is that I never looked at Longclaw as a family sword. I always looked at it as John's sword. It's just his sword. And it was it, like, this probably, it, like, it means nothing, but it painted a different picture to me when Jorah's like, now it's your sword, pass it down to your children. And it's like, this is this, it could be the start of a potential house. And obviously, John's possibly going to die and, like, he's not going to live happily ever after. But I just thought that aspect of it was so strange that I never thought of before. Well, I didn't. I didn't think about it in those terms of a start of another house. I thought of it in more of terms as a, a, that it would now become the Stark, because the one the Starks had is gone. It was melted yeah. down, turned into what is well an Oathkeeper. I suppose Oathkeeper Brienne has it, so that could be turned into a Stark sword as well. But I didn't even think of that. I thought this was saying that this is going to be the Stark sword. But I don't know the whole thing with about him being a Targaryen. Maybe he'll end up being a Targaryen. Yeah, sword. And I don't it's. Know. It's interesting, like, um, one of the Game of Thrones uh, channels that I consume, it's not, they're not actually on YouTube, they're a podcast, they're, they're just a Game of Thrones podcast, the unofficial podcast with a couple guys, and uh, they were talking about George R. R. Martin referring to a lot of history, and they are saying how you have the Lancasters and mm. another family that's like the Starks, whatever, but the whole thing was that the end of this history, I'm going to butcher it, but the whole end of the story is that these two houses formed a new house, um, and the sigil was the combination of the two, and they started new. And that's what's so funny. I think about um, that could apply to many things. Tyrion and Sansa, mm -hmm. they could end up together by the end of this. Jon is both Targaryen and Stark. Who's to say he might start his own thing? Like, I just feel like the possibilities are really open. And and they were comparing it to history. I need to look more into that because it, it's like really comparable to um, certain histories. But I, I I don't know what they are. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of talked a bit about this, the War of the Roses. I did a little study of there this you go. way back when I did my first uh, predictions video. I talked about this. My prediction based off of history, and I'm not sure. this. I made this like three or four years ago, so I'm not sure if I'm still sticking by it now, but was that uh, Sansa would become Queen of Westeros, and that's yep. how the show would end because uh, you talk about Elizabeth, and I can't remember her number, but you know the Queen Elizabeth who's, that had movies about and who's most fam infamous. She was known as like the Virgin Queen. And I just had the impression that they were b building Sansa to become a character like her. Uh, I, and as I said, I'm not still, I'm not still on board because the foreshadowing this season doesn't seem to be in support of that. Uh, it seems to be more supportive of the John and Danny being a thing, but it could still be possible that John and Danny are a thing right up until the end, but then they both die or otherwise go away and thus yeah. leaving Sansa at the very end to take over, which I think is still a possibility because I will mention that HHH1200 uh, in the chat said that something earlier that they thought that uh, John is already dead and once magic leaves the world, he's gone. So they don't see him uh, lasting. I think that's a valid yeah. point. Yeah, exactly. John's one of those guys, like he could be, he could end anywhere in the season or series and I wouldn't know. Um, with like Tyrion and Sansa, I feel like that's like, the perfect bittersweet ending. Like they do talk a lot about that bittersweet ending and how do you do it? And like, I think Tyrion and Sansa, that, that is a really good send off, but obviously it's pure speculation. And we don't even know if there's going to be a king or queen at the end of this or, or what's going to happen. And with the whole hint with Daenerys having to reelect people or whatever, I think it'll be, it'll be really strange to see uh, how it is going forward. And if they'll even touch on that, the next book's called Dream of Spring. Are we going to see this set up to that? Or I don't know. Well, see, that's interesting because you talk about history, and if we base this, and if we say this is based off the War of Roses, which he said, but of course, there's a lot of other influence, not just the War of Roses. A lot of different history comes into it, but in history, but if you say it is mostly based off of that, then the democracy thing would be a huge departure because democracy didn't come yeah. to centuries later yeah. from this time point. That was my initial complaint. Is like I'm just like I just don't fit. Democracy fits in this world, and uh, if you're HBO and you want to do a spinoff of the, of the, <laughs> like, the sequel that wouldn't work out um but they're they outright they have outright said that their spinoffs will be prequels i think they, oh, yeah. they are outright so. oh yeah they said that it's going to be something that we know of too i'm just yeah, yeah. i'm just wondering whether uh in like 20 years if they're like hey like why don't we do a sequel <laughs> like why I not, hope not. But, I, hope, uh, I hope the ending i hope the ending is really definitive yeah um, anyways, let's get over the wall. We get a lot of interactions. We get, you know, Tormund and Gendry chat, and we get Gendry talking to the Brotherhood. Um, we get a lot of these scenes. Were there any standouts in these at all that you liked or didn't like? We got Tormund and the Hound talking about Brienne. Just all the conversation oh, scenes. I think the Tormund and the Hound thing, I think, <laughs> is my favorite. It's just because not so much of what they were talking about, but just the way they were interacting seems so true to their characters. Like, just to see Tormund being like, oh, all conversation the Hound being like, oh, fuck off. And it was just so great seeing those two together. Like, seeing, like, Gendry whining about being Brotherhood, like, I think we needed that, but that was a bit less interesting. And the, the Jor and John thing, that was okay. To me, the, the Hound and the... <laughs> and Tormund was the best because you, those are, I think, taking the most advantage of seeing two characters we've never seen together before and seeing how they would interact. Yeah, the Hound to me was definitely a highlight. What you're whinging about. I loved all of it. It was really <laughs> cool. um, one yeah. thing. One thing that like I pulled from it, and I want to hear like your point of view. I was really unsure how I feel about it, and I just yeah, I wanted to hear from you. When Tormund is talking to uh, John and he's talking about Daenerys and how she wants him to bend the knee. Um, for all that shit and then Tormon ends up saying that like he talks about Mance Raider and he says that Mance was a very proud man um that John spent too much time with the free folk and um Tormon asked the question how many men have died for their pride and I think that was showing like he was giving shade at Mance and I feel like that contradicted his whole mm. story arc so I just didn't know if that belonged in there or not because I think Tormon would seems, understand yeah. that Mance is like fuck my pride and Tormund is there being like, oh, Mance Raider, what a fucking idiot. He died for pride. Like, I just feel like it didn't fit. Yeah, that's a very good point. I actually felt the same way, actually, now that you mentioned that, that that line did seem out of place. It felt like, felt like mainly his plot convenience in order to have, um, you know, the push. It was Tormund pushing John towards Daenerys. 
Pass, which is what there is what they're building on. So they won that sort of pushed these two together. And as they it's not the first time they referenced the old man's rated thing because in the cave with John and Daenerys and uh, Daenerys talked about don't let your pride get in the way. It was basically the same thing that John had said to Mance. And so now Tormund's just reinforcing that. But I don't think the analogy holds because really Mance didn't get that many wildlings killed. He actually tried his best to get the wildlings uh, south of the wall. Him not kneeling just got himself killed. John and Tormund were still able to save, mo uh, well, not well, not all of them, but most of the wildlings. Uh, and they didn't have to bend the knee to do it. So I don't know, I don't know why Tormund would have to take this position. It seems really fake and just plot convenience. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And even from his perspective, like, would he bend the knee to John? Like, probably not. And I don't think he'd say it was pride. Um, but I guess you're right. It does set up to John inevitably saying that he bends the knee, which, uh, yeah. But then, um, I think after that we get, oh, another scene I want to talk about is Beric and Darian and John. Um, I loved when Beric and Darian was talking about death, like death is the enemy. You can't beat it. Um, all of that stuff. And, uh, John realizes that, you know, he's the shield that guards the realms of men. So I just... With Beric and Darian, and we've seen him touch on it a lot, like he feels like he's he's been given life again and he knows that he's important and he thinks that, hey, like maybe I could run and go kill the Night King because I'm not supposed to die in the cold. And uh, he's mm. there to fight death. So like what do you think he's, his significance is moving forward? Because he's going back. And your brother too. Your brother's like, I swear to God, he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> what was his? Well, now, uh, yeah, my brother said he read it in the plot leaks, and I was certain that he was wrong because I did he, not. He read was this. certain. Yeah, he's like he's dead, guys. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty sure that that wasn't in the plot leaks. That it wasn't Beric. It was just Thoros. And we and but he, who knows? He could die next episode. But I was um I was sure that he would survive. But uh yeah, he have died. To be perfectly honest, and I think that was one of the issues I had with this whole thing overall. Is some people said this about episode four battle with Jamie and the dragon saying, "Oh, no one died, so there's no real stakes." I didn't. I didn't. Was fine with the battle. I don't care that anyone didn't. Any main characters didn't die. You don't always have to have main characters die. And of course, Randall did die in the next episode, so you can count that. But with this battle, I actually did feel they needed more main characters to die. I think Thoros was not good enough. They should have had at the very least two. I thought they should have had like three. Like when that they had that scene when Tormund was being by all his wives. I was sure he was a goner. But yeah. but he survived. But I think Beric's surviving. I don't know. I don't. I, it just seems odd to me that there's so much emphasis put on Beric now, where he's this character who barely appeared in season three, and we hadn't seen him in four seasons, and we get two seasons, two scenes of him last season, and then all of a sudden he's the main character. It just it just seems really odd. Why are they focusing on him? I think they are definitely setting him up to sacrifice himself in some noble way, uh, and I don't know. And it seemed kind of, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it seemed kind of exposition heavy the way he pointed out, oh, there's the Night King. We need to kill him and all the whites will die. It seems yeah. like end of the show. <laughs> well, to me, that that's honestly how I thought it would go. Like from like, like a season ago, it just, it just to me, it naturally makes sense. And my argument's like, it's, it's not, um, I've always said he wargs. We've had this discussion before. And when you kill him, his connection's lost. But there could be another reason for that as well. And it just makes sense. It's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe of handling shit. You kill the boss and everyone dies. But I feel yeah, like in this way I they mean, could make it work. It seems yeah, very yeah. A cliche I've seen before. Uh, and I know you're not familiar with Star Trek, so I won't get too much into it. But there's examples with the Borg where they do this as well in Marvel. And it just seems like such a cliche. Kill the head and everyone else dies. I mean, it does make sense from a story standpoint, but it does just, just cliche. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I agree that people should have died more. And I just, with this episode, I feel like they nerfed the White Walkers a little bit. Like, I, I just feel like, what's that? Nerf them, so you mean like, like made them soft? They made them a bit softer. Like I don't know. Like every time we've seen them, we've seen them at um, um, and with Bran when they like overrun the whole thing, and they like crawling over each other, and with 
um, hard home. It's just an outright massacre. But with this one, they treated it. It was a lot slower. And I wonder, and I wonder, um, I don't know, like just certain things like they're, they're waiting at the water, but then we see them climbing out of the water, grabbing people after. And I just feel like, and they were attacking John one at a time. Like when everyone was boarding Daenerys, John, a lot of them were just standing watching. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that it wasn't a massacre that we got before and they were on the, we're on their home turf. Just contrived writing because they can't have John die. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just they showed them more aggressive. Was. And then that was how like they they lured them in, right? With the with the fire. So like, was he a scout and he just came with some of his guys? Like, I just I don't know. I, I didn't know that they traveled in singles like that as scouts because we've only ever seen them together. Like when they finally got the group of like ten whites and that one white walker. Yeah, I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I. I didn't really get the sense that they were nerfed, but I do I totally agree that this this whole thing, this whole sequence was nowhere near as like scary or shocking as like Hard Home. Like I think yeah. this to me the whole thing failed to live up to what a Hard Home Home was. I still think Hard Home was a masterpiece, just the whole way it was executed. I just didn't have that same feeling with this. And I think I agree. for me a lot of that had to do with this whole mission being stupid in the first place. This whole mission yeah. to get a white is dumb, and these throwing these characters together was very rushed, and so it was hard for me to actually feel anything. Uh, even yeah. though the characters I love, like I love the Hound, I love John, I love Tormund, but it was still the whole thing felt kind of fake. Yeah, no, I I agree, and I feel like the writing, like it was written in a way to try and feed that to be possible, and like because of that, the action slowed down. Like with Hard Home, it was always like extremely intense. Like it was like survival, 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 and then we got character development. But with this, it's like we get a polar bear, a polar bear attacks Thoros. <laughs> they kill the polar bear. Like why was there just a random polar bear? And then that's the tracks to lead them forward. So then it's like a small attack, they move forward. They attack a small group of guys, they move forward. They get stranded on an island, so they wait a couple days, and then the action starts. Like it was very drawn out. Whereas with White Walkers and and Whites, I'm used to seeing just urgency. Like it's like survival. You got to move. You got to move. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just just character wise, like with Benjen, like he came in last minute, but like I would have oh, loved yeah. to see him at the beginning of the episode. Like yeah, build yeah, that. Can we talk about? <laughs> yeah, let's talk. talk let's Benjen? talk about Benjen. Yeah, I just I feel like they just threw that, him in. That was that was I think one of my biggest complaints of the episode. That was one of the things that pissed me off the most about this episode. One of the things I think they most mishandled is having him show up at the last minute. After they just had Daenerys show up at the last minute to save, they have to do it again with Benjen. And I think with Benjen is actually much worse because there was no foreshadowing. There was no... A, this was a deus ex machina. Deus yeah. ex machina Benjen. And he just shows up, uh, puts down the horse, and then dies. Yeah. And it's it's so it's so dumb. It's like yeah. it's such a stupid way to kill off this character. It makes his whole like I wasn't even the way they had him in season six. I thought wasn't that fleshed out, and I wanted to see more yeah. of him. And the fact that all it is is build up, and it makes the whole thing feel really shoehorned in. I, I feel Especially like, uh... if you can if you compare Cold Hands to the books, which is even though we haven't even gotten nowhere near this far, yeah. even so far, it was way better handled than this. This was just like, oh, let's shoehorn this Deus Ex Machina to save John. <laughs> it was dumb. And plus, John still should have died of hypothermia. He was in the freaking frozen lake. <laughs> That's my gripe, living up in the Great White North. It's like, yeah, yeah with Benjen, like, and like with Bran maybe could have communicated with him, but I wish they showed that. But the whole thing with Benjen is... Like last season, I thought he was great. You know, we got we got to know him, perfect. And he would have been a great character to keep going forward. Like he seems like he's very significant in the sense where he's undead. He's been created by Dragonglass, just like the Night King. And I think he would have been a, an interesting character to evaluate going forward. But I feel like they're like, oh, it'd be cool to get a scene where John finally sees Benjamin again. So let's throw him in water, which I feel like was unnecessary. Like why did they do that? They just threw him in water. He got out, but then, but then, this is what blew my mind. The whites are leaving. They're, they decided to leave. Were they going to go get the chain so they can drag the dragon out? Because the dragon is right there. So there's just some things where I was, I was a little bit confused. Now, Max, I'll tell you exactly why the whites were leaving. It's because the pond John had to get out of the pond. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> John had exactly. to get out of the pond. It's just yeah, just just little things like that annoyed me because it's like it's like fuck. They're on their own and they're fighting whites. That's cool. Well, let's just make the ice crack.
oh fuck we need to bring Benjamin in let's make john fall in the water like it was just they just did it for the sake of it like john john being left behind really didn't serve the plot in any way other than to get benjin to die and it had i think this gets what's that and i was just gonna say i think this gets back to what we were saying last week about episode five is that there needed to be more episodes we needed more of benjin to build him up to make it more palatable to some yeah. foreshadowing we need in another episode it's, they're rushing the season too much yeah we just yeah we needed more time if you're gonna kill off a character like that like give us time with them like Benjamin should have met them over uh, at Eastwatch, being like, "Hey, like I, I was let know by this, blah blah blah, and I'm here to escort you to this Arrowhead that you saw, or like something like that." And then we get character moments with him too, and then maybe his death could have meant more. Um, well, I could just imagine like the Dan and Dave or the writers. Well, you see, we couldn't do that because if you did that, then we couldn't have this Deus Ex Machina moment with him writing in yeah. and saving John at the last second. Yeah, it was I know. Done, it, it was is, just yeah. contrived writing. <laughs> yeah, and there was just yeah, there was a lot of it. I just wonder why they handled it a certain way, like the way they did, because it could have it was played very straight. But it's like you got Bran, who we saw the episode before, flying ravens there. Like, why wasn't Bran over the wall? He, he would have been there watching his brother. Maybe the crow could have had a, a vital role. Instead of sending Gendry on a fucking marathon, why don't you have Bran <laughs> Worgen to... Why don't you have Bran finally fly, Worgen to a dragon, and just start flying, and then she'll have to follow? Like, I don't know. I just I just wish that they used Bran more. I think with the Bran Worgen to the dragon, they might be saving that. So I'll give them yeah. a pass on that. They're saving that for something special. But I do totally agree with you that... Brand is being severely, you know, very criminally underused yeah. this season. He, he should yeah. have had much bigger involvement in in this episode, but he was nowhere to be found. Yeah, I, th- I hope he shows up in the next episode. But even if he does, it still doesn't change the fact that he was underused for the the whole season. Oh, 100 percent. And there's so many of these plot points. I think Brand would have been so vital, and I would have bought it. Like if Brand said, "You have to go north to capture White," I would have believed Brand more than I would have uh Tyrion like maybe Bran would see that that's the only way or or something like that because he could tell John what Cersei's doing Cersei feels like she's on the rope she feels like she can't win this war she will listen to you if you approach her at a, a, a certain way like I don't know I just I just well, wish they on, used on, the, on the other hand I will say that this this plan is too stupid to come from Bran so in that case, <laughs> it makes sense coming from Tyrion <laughs> yeah so I don't know and then um what else do we get? Yeah, them waiting out in the cold. Thoros ends up dying, um, which I, I was I was fine with. I guess I just I wish we didn't get that pause in the action because I felt like all the stakes were gone because I just got to stand there, and a two two feet gap of ice kept them from attacking them. So I thought mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, when the action hit, of... it hit. Yeah. I mean, are we going to talk about the, the the teleporter thing? <laughs> I mean, there was you know what. In... You didn't have a problem yeah. with it? The I, thing is, you know what? I had a problem with it when I looked at the map. All right. <laughs> yeah. Why? What was your problem I'm with saying, it? I'm not saying it because I had a problem. I'm saying that I've heard from tons of people, like people, casual fans, like people who barely watched the show are being like, how are they traveling so fast? And to me, this shows that this isn't just like a lot of the fanboys try to play it off. Like, oh, you just it's just a bunch of uh, book purists or nitpicky people who like to nitpick the show noticing this teleporting thing or the inconsistency. No, it's everyone. Yeah. Like all the casual viewers, everyone is noticing that this seems really off. Uh, and particularly with, I suppose you could say dragons fly really fast. But Westeros... <laughs> You talk about the map. It's George R. R. Martin said it was the size of South America, and they're basically cool. going from one end to another. Yeah, and yeah. I looked with... at it like it's depressing. Dragons don't care. <laughs> he just watches like fucking all the way up there. Like it's, it's like, but the Raven had it. Like I wish they had a better way to explain it because the like Gendry ran a marathon and sent a Raven. That Raven went all the way to Dragonstone, and then she flew all the way back. Like it's like, uh, explain it better. This is where Bran could have been useful. Like, ah, fuck, I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose what they're saying is, it, they, you know, the Hound and John and all of them were sitting on that frozen lake for several days. Which I suppose, I mean, I guess you could buy it, but it just seems off. There's something that just seems yeah. wrong about it. 
Yeah. And just the one thing that bugged me is the reason why they were safe is because of that water, which I, 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 I don't think I'm ever going to get over. <laughs> I just, I just didn't, I just didn't like it. And then uh, the spear, the, the, uh, the night King has a killer javelin throw. He should do professional because he punctured that thing. And to me, I'm not, I, I, the, the Viserion dying to me made sense. I don't know. Just seeing the ice puncture, like it's ice and fire and you see fire coming out of his chest. Like to me, I bought it. It made sense to me. Let's see. Javelin throw. He killed the uh, Viserion. Oh, really? No, that bothered me. <laughs> I had That was probably one of the other big issues I had with it. It just seemed too perfect. I suppose <laughs> we talked about this earlier with the Green Sing. If the Night King's revealed to be a Green Singer and he knew this was coming, then I guess that would explain it a bit more. But then, then that makes him, that makes Bran shit compared to him because Bran should have yeah. seen this come and warned him about it. Uh, so I just don't, it's just. I don't know. The, the Night King seems too perfect of a character. He's too much of a Mary Sue. Uh, yeah. and, and it's just, it bothered me that they were able to kill the dragon so easily. And uh, he seemed to not even like notice when the dragons show up. That just annoyed me. That they had yeah. this freaking dra- javelin already prepared and ready to go. Yeah, like I said, but, I just wish he knew about it. I just wish he knew that the dragons were coming, and that's why he did it. But I don't know. Um but anyways, I really want to quickly address the final scene. So John is with Daenerys, and uh, she sees the stab wounds, which they've been hinting at this whole season. She's kept, she keeps wanting to know why he was stabbed by his people, <laughs> and uh, I guess Heavy she did. Percent, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but how did you feel about John bending the knee? Well, this is this made a lot of sense to me. Like I even said this in our previous discussions. I kind of saw this coming. Uh, it made sense, especially after she he showed up and she showed up and saved them. And now she knows she the White Walkers are a threat. Now she and she lost one of her dragons fighting against them, and she's vowing to fight against the Night King. It makes complete sense for John to bend the knee because all he cares about is defeating the White Walkers. That's the only thing on his mind. So I totally understand uh, whether or not this will be a good decision. Whether or not the other lords will actually allow him to do this is another question entirely. But I do think I do. This is a, I totally buy it, and I think it was a great scene. Yeah, and I, I was one of those people who were saying that John should would have never bend the knee. Like, and uh, it was the scene was kind of a shock because I found it kind of funny when Daenerys is like, "I will save you. Like, I will, I will fight for you. I will fight with the White Walkers." And then John's like, "Okay, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna bend the knee." Like, it's like he didn't have to. So I guess, I guess they they did build it up, and he realized that she was, you know, who she was. He really learned a lot about her through throughout the series and the fact that she yeah. came and that I guess that scene really touches on it too that we didn't talk about when Tyrion wants her to stay but she doesn't and I think that speaks a lot to her that she went there mm-hmm. and saved Jon so I think that could really I think that yeah. could justify it looking at it um, but uh, while we go on ask some questions we want to do some quick questions before we end this stream we're well, going to go pretty much uh, also hour. Want to say that I, I do think that they had been building towards it like with the whole thing with John talking to Masande about how great uh, Daenerys is. So uh, to me, it seemed like it was obvious foreshadowing that they were building towards it. And all the talks about Tormund saying, oh, you're letting your pride get in the way, to me is obvious that it was all building towards this moment. Yeah, for sure. I just wonder how how that's going to work going forward. Like, are we going to see, uh, like, we've seen every interaction with them as equals. And it feels like, like, they really hinted at, like, chemistry here. Like, they were holding hands. Like, there was something going on here. Um, so I yeah. just wonder, are we going to... Well, I still think... It, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I still think it's definitely building towards a marriage because I think things are going to change when they find out that, that John's a Targaryen. Yeah. And I and I could definitely see uh, Daenerys maybe even, even before knowing that being like, you know what? I'd rather have you as my husband than a just another vassal. Yeah. Because she's starting to see the strength in him. So I, I think that's where it's building to. Yeah, because I just wonder, like, I feel like he would marry without bending the knee. So I was really curious to that. And their interaction going forward, I don't know if he's going to treat her as his queen or as Danny. Like, you know what I mean? So I'm curious how that will work. Well, see, he he hasn't officially bent the knee yet, so that's still possible. Or, you know, officially bending the knee. Because he hasn't told anyone in the north about it yet. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it'll be really interesting. Um, crap, I wanted to say something, but I forgot. Um, bu- 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 
Do I remember? Nope, I forgot it. I lost it. Um, let's look at your <laughs> questions. Do you guys have any? Ba -ba -ba. <laughs> Megan, where will Sam be next episode? That that's revealed in the plot leak. Um, and it, you know what? It just make it makes sense. I think we can really extrapolate. Like it makes sense that Sam would be going to Winterfell yeah. because he heard from Bran in that Raven um, that he's right. back in Winterfell and all that stuff. So I feel like that's a natural place for him to go. And he, yeah, and he has all he all has all the scrolls he stole from the Forbidden section. So it's obviously he wants to do something to fight against the White Walkers. Yeah, for sure. I just wonder how that's gonna go because Sam, you know, he went to the Citadel to cure Jorah, and really to discover dragon glass on Dragonstone. And then you know, Gilly stumbled through Raga and Dorn. And I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if that's gonna come up uh, next episode. I I feel like it will. And visions too, like. Are we gonna see a vision? Like we've talked about this. Like I, I don't know. Yeah. I honestly don't know. And and what would we see? Would we see the marriage in Dorn? I would love to see a flashback, but I'm not sure if that'll happen. I agree with my brother when he said this wasn't a plot leaks because I remember seeing this in the plot leaks too. It was really brand. Yeah, brand that episode. we'll get a brand vision in the final episode. Yeah. Um, another question, Leo Vic. Um, do you think that the Night King foresaw Danny's arrival with dragons, and that's why he waited? What do you think, Mark? Uh, well, I mean, that's what we've already talked about. Yeah. This is possible. It's possible that he has green sea seeing abilities because they're from they're created by the children of the forest, who where the green seeing abilities came from in the first place, and then transferred to humans. So it makes total sense. It would transfer to White Walkers, especially the head of the White Walkers, because we know they have all these uh, abilities from the north. Be happy with that until it's explained in the show. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. still waiting to yeah. see. And that's my question is how would they reveal that in the show? Like, you know, I'm obviously the next episode could make or break how I feel about this episode. Like, you know, if they, I feel like personally this episode didn't have many things to reveal, like um, with the Night King being a green seer or knowing that the dragons were coming. So I'm just wondering how it, or if they could play that off. Um, and regards to the, the, the white dragon, I'm confident we're going to be seeing, we're going to be seeing that next episode too. Yeah, um, can I talk about this plot leak? I guess we're talking about yeah, the plot we're just, uh, yeah. Okay, so there, I read this plot leak, which uh, I, I haven't. You haven't said you read it, and a lot. And my brother said he didn't read it, so I wasn't sure if this was a legitimate leak or not because I went to a lot of sites that had these fake leaks that weren't really from the plot leaks. But the one thing I read now, it looks totally true, and it looks so dumb to me, is that the Night King's going to use the White Dragon to breathe blue fire and tear down the wall and it just seems to me that that's going to happen and i really don't want it to but it does seem like that's definitely the direction they're going to i just get that feel of it from watching this episode yeah yeah for sure um so we're going to take a couple more questions one that I, I don't know if um like do you care who directs episodes mark um somewhat i saw that i saw that question I saw that question about the the uh, director in the episode, and I didn't think the directing has been particularly bad this year. I think the directing's been fine. It's the writing, yeah. that I think, is the issue. I totally agree. And and uh, but there, there's there's one standout that I would have loved to get for this season, but it's not around. But I hopefully he's around next season. Is Miguel Sapochnik? He directed mm -hmm. Battle of the Bastards, Winds of Winter, Hard Home. He's directed all the heavy hitters, and they're all in my top yeah. in my top. And um, look, I'm not I'm not much of a. Oh yeah, and the gift. So four episodes. He's directed four episodes. So he directed the yeah. gift too. I didn't know that. But with him, it's yeah. like I yeah. noticeably see certain like symbols. He has a really good way of showcasing things. So like he's per a person that I want to get. But like everything I thought was shot great. Like the action sequences, like just shooting on an action level, which Miguel Sapochnik has proven that he can do. This director, I think it was Alan Taylor. I think he shot it great. I love like the one shot, and I love how Game of Thrones has really coined that. It's and they move on to different director because in the first couple of seasons, it was what's I can't remember his name now. It was something Marshall who directed Blackwater and directed uh, 
uh, with watchers on the wall. So he was the one they brought in at first to do the big action stuff, but then I think he became busy, so then they got Miguel. Now, uh, he, if he's busy now, they're going to get someone else. That's fine. I mean, I am I was happy with the way these were directed, like particularly with the loot dragon scene in episode four. I loved the, the way it was directed, like the cinematography and the acting was one of my favorite parts of the of that whole battle. So I... I was in love with the directing there. So yeah. I'm I'm fine. I do agree he's an awesome director, but if he didn't return, I wouldn't be too heartbroken because it seems like to have ample replacements. Uh, so, and it's not, to, as I said, it's not the directing I'm worried about. It's the writing. It's the writing that I take issue with. No, I, yeah, I totally agree. Real issue is the writing. Um, another question from Colonel Doomsday. I'm sure you know him well, Mark. Uh, he <laughs> asks, uh, will they say the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives? So we know that Sansa says it. Oh, well, yeah, I've been saying ever since we saw that in the trailer that this is going to be what Sansa says to Littlefinger when she kills him or when he dies. Yeah. But that is so funny because, like, right now the pack survives. Right now Sansa and Arya don't look like a pack. And they don't even well, want to yeah, go that's... fucking near Bran because they think he's a weirdo. So, so... That's the whole point. That's the whole point of the speech, though, is Littlefinger was trying to divide the pack. And so she's going to realize that, that that's how they're going to overcome him is that they're going to come together as a pack. And that's why that's why the speech will be so powerful. Uh, so I still think she's going to say that as as he dies. <laughs> and then I wonder, like, if those words apply to every anything else, because like if you look at titles of episodes, words mean more than just one thing. Like, I wonder if there's a lone wolf, like Jon Snow, for example. Lone wolf dies. Well, of course he bends the knee this episode. Um, so I don't know. I think it's just it'll be interesting to see if there's any more lone wolves we can pick out. Littlefinger, I think, is toast. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. One thing I did want to ask you about, Max, is he's talking about the plot leaks. Were you surprised we didn't get the sex in the boat this episode? I thought it was next episode. That's what I that read. Doesn't, oh, right. I thought it would be at in this episode. At the, and it seemed like that scene between them, like when they were touching hands, it seemed like that's what it was leading to. I was actually surprised when it didn't happen. Yeah, she oh, raw. He looked in rough shape, but <laughs> I'd be really impressed if uh, if something happened. It remind me of when Sam first had sex with Gillies when after yeah, he was lie. just been beaten up. Yeah, he, <laughs> he just, he just lays himself. there. Yeah, no, no, for sure. For sure. So but uh, so did you did you read it would be after the King's Landing meeting? I think it'd be on the way back. And I, I, I heard that it ends with them going to uh, Winterfell. Um, so we'll see what happens. I've always said that um, in regards to Winterfell, it may be in some danger if the wall comes down. They may be at threat, so they're kind of going back, and that's like the climax of the episode. Is like, holy shit! Like, what's going to happen? Uh, they will they make it to Winterfell in time? What's going on? Because the threat's coming south. Um, but yeah, looking at season eight, like I don't, I can't even wager a guess as to how it will go. Like, it'll be all over the place. Yeah, I'm not too optimistic, to be perfectly honest. And the main reason is six episodes. And we saw how rushed seven episodes was, so it does not inspire strength. Uh, you know, to me, that uh, this is only going to be six episodes. Yeah, no, I agree. And I hope we get a lot more reveals. That's why I'm a little disappointed with this episode, is I feel like, you know, if they were going to reveal, for example, John's going to ride Rachel. Space it out. Reveal it in this episode. Yes. I would have loved to see yes. Regal save John rather than Benjamin. Like, put those reveals in. And same with character deaths. Don't don't save all the character deaths for the last season. Spread them out. Make this episode more meaningful. Like, you know, don't don't spare everybody for just a massacre. Um, so yeah, I just I just think they should spread everything out sparingly. And I hope we get another Hodor reveal. Like that was like a huge reveal to me. That I was like, holy shit. I hope we get more of that. And I don't know if we will. I don't think we will. I don't know. We'll see. I, I will say the one character death I did think worked for this episode was, uh, I guess, I think in the chat someone was confirming earlier was Viserion. So I'll just say Viserion for the moment. That uh, that that his death was that was really shock. You know, shock. Even though I wasn't happy with the whole driving during thing, I think the way they played out the set is how affected Daenerys was by it was very was a very effective death. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys, we're going to take one more question. Um, Mark, do you have any uh, preferences? Any questions you want to take? I just start reading through. Uh, 
Oh, it's just a, them, yeah. a small slew at the bottom of the chat. I'm just trying to figure out what the best one answer is. I thought I saw one further up. Hold on. Drink break. <laughs> I think it interrupts Russ. Da, da, da. Well, there's a question here about brain warging uh, from Derek, who's asking he hasn't been touching a tree or warging. Uh, so does he even have to be connected to a tree now to do it? Where I don't think he does. I assume uh, I assume that he doesn't need to actually be next to a tree. Although we do see him hanging out by a tree a lot. I so thought it helps. Yeah, I thought he was. I thought he was under the. Do we see him? Oh, he wasn't touching the tree when uh, he was working into the ravens. He was sitting in the wheelchair, but he yeah. wasn't really touching. Yeah, yeah. I guess. He was next to the tree. Then. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know. Um, the way I played off, hmm, I always played him off as like he knows he's able to see all these visions because the blood raven kind of th gave him everything, so he can kind of cycle through it without touching the weirwood tree. But yeah. that, that's interesting. I don't know. It's hard to distinguish between if that's just a show visual thing. Or if that's um, an actual testament to his power, and we've seen that with the ravens. Like, did you when you saw all the ravens flying by? Did you? How did you take that? Was was he less powerful, or was he warging simultaneously into five ravens, kind of showing that he's more powerful? I, I don't know. Oh yeah, I took that. He was, he was working into all the ravens. To yeah, show how powerful. But it looked like their eyes were like blinking. It was almost like he was warging into like one after the other to force them to go in the same direction, but he's doing it so fast that they were just like, I don't know. Think about that. That's yeah, definitely a possibility. But I think we're going to end it there. Um, any other thoughts you want to share Mark? Uh, no, that's, that's about it. And I'm going to make it clear that I didn't hate this episode. And I know I did a lot of whinging as the hound would say about, <laughs> about this episode, but it's, I thought it was, I thought it was good. It just wasn't up to the high standard that yeah. previous like penultimate episodes of the season has said pretty much the episode. This is the episode nine basically. Yeah. And this doesn't really live up to the other episode nines in my opinion, especially the, if you compare it to hard home it, to me, it's not as hard hitting and I had a lot of issues with it, but it's still good. I still thought it was a good episode. Just maybe not as great as I was hoping it would be. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. And I find that, you know, when I watch it over and over again, it kind of, I'm able to forgive certain things. I was really hard on it. Like initially my reaction video, I laid the fuck yeah. out of this episode. But but looking at it, like, you know, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Some of the moves and ideas that they threw out, I didn't like. But um, you really don't know how it's going to end. And you don't know what episode seven is going to show us. Um, so really, we I can't judge this whole season as a whole until we see the next episode. And I'm, I'm honestly really enjoying the season so far. Um, it is a bit rushed, but I am enjoying it. I will say a lot is riding on this final episode for me. Because if this episode fails to sort of satisfy me, I'm not going to say this was a bad season, but I will say it was probably one of the worst of the show. Yeah. And, you know, that's keeping in mind that every season of the show is awesome because the whole show is great and there's no such thing as a bad season. But if the, if the um, last episode tends to be just as sort of a letdown as this one is, then I would say this would be one of the worst seasons of the show. But... Hopefully, I'm wrong, and the next episode ends up being awesome. In terms, I hope so. Problem. They got an hour and 20 <laughs> minutes to impress us. That's going to be a hell of an episode. Um, yeah. I'm really excited to see how it goes. I just want to thank everybody in the chat for joining us. And, uh, Mark, let them know where they can find you. Uh, yes, I'm over on Enchantment of Eternity. It's my channel. I try to do at least two, sometimes three uh, episodes, uh, videos for Game of Thrones. And then once Game of Thrones ends, I'm going to turn on to covering other shows like uh, Star Trek. I'm into Star Trek and stuff and Mr. Robot's coming up too. Stuff like that. So yeah, be sure to check out. Do all sorts of theory videos throughout the off season as well. Yeah, so please check him out. His link for his channel, Enchantment of Eternity, is in the description below, so please check that out. Um, and one more thing about my reaction video, I'm re-uploading that right now, so you can check that out. Uh, but until next time, I'll, uh, I'll see you guys later.